Spiritual Focus with Amanda and Ben. Alright guys, welcome to uh, week 8 of Clinical Focus. This week we've got a special guest, Amanda, I believe. Exactly, you're right. So we have um, Harry with us today. How are you, Harry? Yeah, good, thanks. Good to be here. Excellent. Can we get a little bit of bio data on Harry, Amanda? Um, yeah, <laughs> Harry is um, a, a professor of uh, clinical medicine from John Hopkins University, and um, he's he's vit- visiting Australia this week, and uh, we are we are so fortunate to have him um, here today on the show. So, so expect- thank you very much uh, for your time, uh, Professor Harry. Yeah, no worries. Uh, you know, I'm always always available for you guys. Fantastic. Fantastic. It's, it's amazing what connections uh, Amanda and I have. But we, we expect him to be quite quite an expert today, so we're going to put him to the test. <laughs> exactly. And and he's involved in a lot of research. Uh, so what's your uh, field of research, uh, Professor? Uh, well, mostly, mostly in pneumonia and uh, infectious diseases. Oh, excellent. Which is the topic of today. So well, maybe we yeah, should. Yeah, maybe yeah. Well, it, it wasn't the topic of today, but maybe we should talk about pneumonia exactly. today. Yeah, Perfect, yeah. yeah. Yes. We, we were supposed to talk about surface anatomy, but now we're going to change that into pneumonia. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, Fantastic. Do it. Let's do it. All right. So, um, uh, Ben, I think uh, you have a list of questions that you'd like uh, our guests today to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll just throw it on to uh, Professor Harry. Oh, uh, we'll um, throw it on to both of us, shall we? Uh, myself and Amanda <laughs> are equally as... Uh, you know, expert. Sure, is, sure. Is. Look, I'll, I'll distribute it as I as I <laughs> need to. But um, why don't you start with what is pneumonia? All right. So um, in a nutshell, pneumonia is basically the infection of the uh, pulmonary parenchyma. So there's sort of two reasons why you get pneumonia. So the pro- 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 proliferation of uh, microbial pathogens is one thing. So getting past the host defense system and all the um, defenses of the the lungs and getting into the um, alveolar spaces is what uh, is one of the main factors in uh, in the causation of pneumonia. The second is the host immune response. So the immune response causing, you know, your your pure and sputum and and or your cough and everything like that is a uh, is basically the second factor that uh, really determines both the severity and uh, the um how long you're going to have the pneumonia so yeah those are the two things that really define pneumonia in in a way okay um and how many children do you think under five years of age does pneumonia kill each year oh well uh you know the statistics change uh, from year to year because there's there's always uh, um you know more and more data being available to the uh to the world but uh i'd guess that uh the incidence is around five to eleven, uh, um, five to eleven per thousand. So it's quite high in the young and the elderly, with a mortality of approximately ten percent in the hospital and um, thirty percent when you're admitted to the uh, ICU. So it is quite a serious problem and mm. um, not a funny problem. Not a funny problem at all. No, no it's, it's it's quite serious. Yeah, the answer yeah. you were actually looking for there was one point four million globally. 1. 000. All right, so you were looking for a number rather yeah. than percentage. You yeah. should, should have stated that. Yeah, you? sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, it's your bad. Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so how does how does pneumonia actually occur? Well, um, it's uh, one of the most common theories and the most common ways of um, getting pneumonia is uh, while you're asleep, um, there's slight aspiration from the oropharynx. So aspiration occur- uh, frequently occurs during the sleep, most uh, most commonly in the elderly, and uh, also, in other ways, if you're intoxicated or, for example, having an epileptic fit or something like that, there's always um, the possibility of aspiration pneumonia. So, um, an aspirate from your oropharynx um, gets into your trachea, into your lungs, and uh, causes the pneumonia. So, yeah, that's one of the most common ways of getting pneumonia, I guess. Okay, what's what's the infectious agent, usually? Um, yeah, I'll... Um, do you want to... Shall we hand this to Amanda, or... Because... Uh, I think, uh, yeah, sure. Knows. Ooh, get him well, speaking. <clears throat> in terms of the etiology of a pneumonia, um, we have various causes. We the causes include bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Um, although the identification of the specific cause of pneumonia is um, like common practice, many patients can be treated initially 
on the basis of uh, the clinical and demographic features instead of just uh, waiting for lab results. Um, so uh, with patient history, um, the, the history may indicate an underlying condition. For example, the, the incidence of uh, bacterial pneumonia is increased in association with the COPD or alcoholism, as Harry mentioned. Fever is usually but not always present. Um, aerospace disease is uh, evident, ev evidenced by rails and signs of consolidation on physical examination. And you have um, infiltration on chest uh, radiograph. Um, and because of the vast differential diagnosis, it's helpful to consider pneumonia in two ways, like the, the way we classify pneumonia, whether it is developed at home, which is <coughs> known as community acquired, or in a hospital or institutional uh, setting, which we call healthcare associated or nosocomial pneumonia. Um, another way of classifying pneumonia is whether it had a rapid onset with uh, chills, fever and cough, uh, we call it classical or typical pneumonia, as opposed to a more um, indolent onset, uh, which is also known as atypical uh, pneumonia. Uh, so as as the the causes of pneumonia, as, as you mentioned, like for example, if we talk about bacterial pneumonia, the uh, the causes varies according to age, and uh, there's actually a good classification of the. Uh, causes of uh, uh, bacterial causes of pneumonia according to age so if we talk about children um, between the age of six weeks and 18 years uh, viral pneumonia is the most common um, cause uh, followed by um, uh, streptococcus pneumoniae uh, mycoplasma chlamydia pneumoniae also one of the causes uh, if we if you're talking about adults between the age of 18 and 40 um, the, the common three bacterial organisms involved including uh, strep pneumonia, uh, chlamydia pneumonia, and mycoplasma. Adults between the age of 40 and 65, uh, we have strep pneumonia, hemophilus influenzae, anaerobes, viruses, and mycoplasma. And then the elderly above the age of 65, we have strep pneumonia, viruses, anaerobes, and H. Um, influenzae. And then we have special groups of patients. We have um, immunocompromised patients, we have uh, alcoholics, we have patients with cystic fibrosis, patients with underlying respiratory conditions such as uh, COPD, we have neonates, and we have patients with recurrent pneumonia. So the etiology also, again, um, varies in, in those uh, special groups of patients. So, um. I mean, the diagnosis is usually just based off a check test ray. Uh, check test ray. No, didn't get it that time either. Um, <laughs> but how do you really tell between bacterial and non-bacterial causes? Because yeah, they, well, they say on my bridge it's about fifty percent bacterial, but what happens when it's not? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll take this one as a professor. <laughs> nah. Um. Well. Um. We don't really. Um. It doesn't really. Uh concern us at the at the time whether bacterial or viral the more important thing that um, we have to consider is atypical versus typical so as Amanda was talking about before things like onset evolution rigors cough and sputum pleurity pain are, are some of the symptoms but um, you can divide it between typical and atypical so for example in a typical pneumonia the onset is quite sudden while in atypical pneumonia, atypical pneumonia it's more gradual uh, the evolution of it in typical pneumonia really really rapid but in atypical it's very slow progressing rigors you'll find them in typical pneumonia but probably not in atypical um in a cough is present in a typical pneumonia but could be absent or delayed in atypical pneumonia in uh, sputum wise and pleuritic pain uh, in typical pneumonia you're definitely going to see sputum maybe it's blood stained um, and there's often going to be pleuritic pain while in atypical, atypical pneumonia you probably won't see this so the important thing about typical versus atypical is that the atypical organisms cannot be cultured on standard media. So the atypical organisms like um, what Amanda was talking about, the mycoplasm, the chlamydia, um, and Legionella and things like that are not um, the normal you know, ones where you're going to see the cough, the sputum, the pleuritic pain, rigors, and things like that. So in, in, the, in terms of that, I think um, diagnosis has to be between typical and atypical. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that's uh, some of the main symptoms, signs that you have to look out for uh, when trying to diagnose, I guess. And, yeah, always a good history and examination is more important than uh, a chest x-ray. 
but uh, definitely um, chest x-ray is helpful. Do you, do you know the song um, about the symptoms of uh, pneumonia, Harry? No, I don't, actually. Yeah, enlighten me. I think uh, Ben knows the song. Would you like to, to tell us about the song? No, I, I don't believe I do, man. Okay. What have you got? Fever, cough, seputer. Ah, uh, yes. Fever, cough, seputer. So, um, uh, it's a good way to remember the yeah. classical uh, symptoms of uh, pneumonia. So, we have fever, cough, and uh, sputum. Ah, fever, cough, but, sputum. But, but, but yeah. again, you know, these are really non-specific uh, yeah, um, yeah. symptoms. But... Uh, yeah. Obviously, there are some more specific symptoms, exactly. but they're less yep. common, such as shock, maybe, chest maybe pain. Maybe someone will take this song to the next level and add yeah. more Yeah, could, you, more could you add a verse, maybe, Murder? Exactly. <laughs> so, have either of you guys heard of um, um, the CORB? CORB criteria? The CURB, 60, CURB 65. Well, depends on which country you're in. I, oh, thought, well. I thought Australia was CORB, but if you're in... America, obviously, or in John Jamaica. Hopkins, you might be using uh, Jamaica, uh, yeah, Jamaica. They, they have a different pronunciation of, um, of um, you know, um, the criteria that we use in, in various diseases. Oh, okay. Uh, well, maybe you might know a bit more about Curve 65. As in, uh, to about severity? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. So, um, Curve 65 is uh, quite simple and validated. I don't know about your core or whatever you're talking about before. Um, <laughs> scoring system, you know. Um, and the C, uh, confusion. And um, so on a mental test, a score of like less than eight and things like that um, are a, a good way of determining confusion. Uh, urea, um, greater than seven millimeter, uh, millimole per liter. So I think the normal range is 2.5 to eight uh, millimole per liter. Um, so one that's quite high or even higher than that, getting up to 11 is a good uh, indication. Your respiratory rate greater than 30 um, per minute is um, a normal indication of uh, high severity, BP less than 90 systolic and or maybe um, 60 millimeters of mercury in diastolic um, and the age of 65. So that's where the 65 comes from. So C-U-R-B 65, confusion, urea, respiratory rate, blood pressure and age. So yeah. And um, so the way it works is each of those get a point and that lets, lets you assess the uh, severity of pneumonia. Definitely, yeah. Um, do you have any idea of what the point scores amount to? Uh, what the point score amounts to? Well, um, <clears throat> uh, greater than three uh, is... Uh, so, okay, so if you have around two, um, hospital therapy might be indicated. Greater than three indicates severe pneumonia when you have to consider ICU. Um, but there are also other things that you have to look for, like the increasing risk of death um, with coexisting disease is something that um, is not taken into account by CURB 65. So if you look at the PAO2 and the O2 sats, so O2 sats below 92, um, you're probably going to have to consider ICU as the most um, uh, likely cause of, uh, likely um, avenue for the patient. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really quick, easy way of assessing kind yeah. of severity of pneumonia. Um, what about treating it? How do we How do we go about treating um, pneumonia. Well, yeah, tr- treating pneumonia is um is is quite difficult, and I, I don't think we're we're up to that yet. We've still got to talk about a lot of things, oh, like uh, why the signs are there, and uh, you know, you know, physical examination, and uh, you, you know, things like that. Very important. So, okay, let's look um, into that then. Yeah. Well, um, so in your in your clinical diagnosis, you've uh, really got to take a good history, um, and because you want to be able to say it's definitely pneumonia because though pneumonia is somewhat understood it is uh, definitely one of the highest misdiagnosed and misinterpreted and uh, um, uh, diseases or conditions um, out there so um, when you're trying when you're doing taking your history you're trying to rule out uh, other things from your differential so things like acute bronchitis um, acute exacerbations of chronic bronchitis heart failure, pulmonary embolism, and um, radiation pneumonitis. So all those things have to be ruled out before you can rule in uh, pneumonia. So some of the things that um, you have to consider when uh, uh, talking to your patient um, is... uh, One second... Are they a smoker? Yeah, probably, uh, you know, smoking uh, is uh, one exacerbation of... Um, thing. Okay, here we go. So, 
um, some of the manifestations of uh, the community acquired pneumonia is uh, could be from mild to severe. Yeah, so they can be the patient can be frequently febrile uh, with tachycardia. They might have a history of chills and or sweats, possibly night sweats. The cough is something that you have to really um, dive into and ask everything you know about it. So how long have you had it? What is it like? Is it causing uh, pleuritic pain? Is it productive, non-productive? Do you get purulent sputum? Is it blood tinged? Can you, does it smell? Does it, uh, is it runny and things like that? Is it quite thick and sticky? So cough is another one in your um, systems review that you have to uh, get into quite a lot. And uh, depending on the se severity of it, they might be quite short of breath. So your anatomy and uh, you're looking at accessory uh, muscles of respiration, you know, it's a good way to revise it. Just how, do, how do we assess accessory muscles of respiration so in you, clinical when, examination? Yeah, so when a, when a patient is really uh, struggling for breath, they'll assume the tripod position. So the tripod position is basically um, hands out forward, they're leaning forward and uh, uh, with the hands outstretched because it's, um, it gets all the, the pec muscles and things like that out of the way so that the diaphragm can really work and take a huge breath. I think Manda can definitely... Uh, yeah, I can it. demonstrate yeah. that, but unfortunately we don't have a camera. <laughs> are, there any, uh, yeah. are there any more simple signs for the people who are only just starting to use their um, yeah. uh, accessory muscles or any tests we can do? Um, I think excess, the use of accessory muscles is, is more like looking at... Um, how hard it is for them to breathe and it's it's a more of a, a thing that you just got to practice and see and um something that you'll definitely see uh, like when when a person completes a a sprint you know a hundred meter dash or something like that they walk up to the um to the to the, the small walls that they have they put their arms on the walls and put their heads their heads down trying to get their pec muscles out of the way so they can take as much breath in because they're they're knackered from um, running that dash so that's that's one place that you'll see um, shortness of breath outside of the hospital community and um, yeah I mean to continue with the history you've got to de determine if the pleura is also involved so if the patient experiences pleuritic chest pain so when you ask for chest pain don't just ask do you have chest pain yes or no you have to determine does the chest pain come on with the breath or does the chest pain come on with exertion does the chest pain come on when you're sitting down watching tv does it come on with or without medication and things like that? So determining the type of chest pain will give a good indication of how um, how severe or how, how involved the pneumonia has become. Then um, after, moving, after going from your history and looking at the symptoms, you'd go on to your signs as you do. So um, the varying degree of uh, pulmonary consolidation and the presence of uh, significant pleural fusion, of course, using a stethoscope, using tactile phrematist and uh, vocal resonance as methods of determining this, you can determine how involved the um, the, uh, the pulmonary consolidation is, you know, and looking at respiratory rate, taking your vitals, your O2 sats, as I said um, before, tactile phrematist, the percussion note, if it's um, dull, you've got an underlying consolidated lung, while if it's flat, it's most likely to be pleural fluid. And um, continue, continuing on, uh, crackles, bronchial breath sounds, uh, a possible pleural fl friction rub. I've only ever heard that once uh, in about 20 pneumonia patients. I mean, two, 2 million pneumonia patients as I'm a professor and do this for a, a daily job. <coughs> and um, yeah, so always uh, confusion is a big one as well, which was part of our CURB 65. Um, two other things might be septic shock and organ failure. And that's when you know that uh, this guy is really down the tank. So yeah, that's, uh, that's just a quick rundown of history and examination, things that you have to look out for that in your, when you're doing your OSCEs. Um, definitely have to hone in those respiratory system uh, questions and um, the, uh, the respiratory exam. And uh, I think I'll uh, leave the treatment question to uh, Amanda, if that's okay. Yeah, so man, uh, don't talk about uh, let's see, let's see what he's uh, remembered. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely be there to help him out if. Uh, cool. So, um, let's talk about the um, the treatment. So, in a nutshell, we use antibiotics to to treat pneumonia, and uh, 
if you want more details than that, you can consult any pharmacology book. But we're going to just go through it um, quickly here. Um, like for community acquired pneumonia, we can uh, divide the... Um, the treatment according to whether uh, we have an outpatient setting or an inpatient setting, whether we have adults or children. So for adults in an outpatient setting, um, in a patient who is previously um, healthy uh, and uh, drug resistance unlikely, we use macrolide or a tetracycline as a first line of therapy. We might um, add uh, some supportive uh, care, like for example, patients should be assessed for hydration status um, and uh, gas exchange and hemodyna hemodynamic uh, stability. If we have uh, uh, an, an adult in an outpatient setting and there are some comorbidities or risk factors for drug resistant uh, uh, strep pneumonia infection, we use uh, fluoroquinolone or a combination of therapies. For example, we might use um, moxifloxacin, amoxicillin, clavulinate. Uh, we might use uh, clarithromycin, azithromycin. Doxycycline. Do doxycycline, exactly. Um, what about what about um, hospital-acquired pneumonia cases that are um, bacterial, of course? Um, we might need to consider some resistance factors. Exactly, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, uh, so once again, we use things like cyclosporins, fluoroquinolones, um, aminoglycosides, and vancomycin in those cases. Exactly. Um, yeah. And they're often given intravenously, intravenously if it's um, a hospital-acquired case. Yeah. And you yeah. know why that is, yeah, because what are the most common organisms that uh, are found in hospital-acquired pneumonia? So you mentioned your aminoglycoside. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else? Was it uh, cephalosporin IV? Yeah, cephalosporin. So your gram-negative bacilli pseudomonas and anaerobes yeah so those those things are the important ones and uh good on you for knowing the antibiotics thank you thank that's, you it's, it's a mark of a good student yeah yeah, um, yeah i'm glad i'm glad you know your stuff though as a professor yeah correct but what about what about viral um cases how would we approach viral cases viral cases again it's it's difficult sometimes to differentiate uh, viral from bacterial cases uh, using clinical picture because sometimes they might present similarly, especially in, in old, very old or very young patients and in immunocompromised. But again, we, uh, in terms of um, viral infections that can cause pneumonia, we usually try to avoid prescribing antibiotics because of the resistance issue. So we, we usually pre prescribe antiviral agents. And um, I believe, uh, Ben, previously you, you mentioned to me before we started recording a couple of um, antiviral agents, and one of them was uh, sultamivir, uh, which uh, we use to treat uh, an influenza virus. So we also use it um, in viral uh, pneumonia. Yeah, so the um, the reason we use a salt, uh, sultamivir is simply because it's got a bit more of a broad spectrum. It's a neuraminidase inhibitor. So it essentially what it does is it stops viral progeny release from um, the cell. So it stops it. It stops the viral from virus from being able to propagate itself, and and it works on both influenza A and influenza B um, cases. Um, another another treatment might be uh, romantidine or um, amantadine, but that that obviously would suggest that you know it's an um, a influenza A case. That's why uh, a seltamivir or a zanamivir or paramivir, some of some of those neuraminidase inhibitors is, is the better option uh, for viral. Uh, pneumonia exactly and amantadine actually is used for um there's another, another um indication it's used for uh, patients with parkinson's disease apparently it boosts up their uh, acetylcholine um, and, release well, do you have any good ways of remembering amantadine I mean, I, actually yes <laughs> there's a, a mnemonic to remember uh, the the way amantadine functions and uh, amantadine sounds like am <laughs> Sounds like a man to dine. It's like there is a man who uh, wants to go <laughs> to a restaurant to have a dinner. And uh, the way to remember it is um, <laughs> a, man, <laughs> a man to dine. <laughs> you're, you're, you're crazy. You're crazy. Carry on, man. So uh, uh, while Manda's trying to catch his breath, 
Yep. You got another question? Or? No, no, no. I want to hear the end of the story, really. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a long story, but basically you have a man who wants to dine. And, <laughs> and then the... Uh, let's let's skip that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's too hilarious. But, Some, yeah. Something about his coat. But uh, yeah, aside from the um, the antibiotics, oxygen therapy, prevent hypoxemia. You know, assisted ventilation is always something that we have to consider inside the hospital. Um, and uh, a lot of the time, uh, pneumonia patients are quite uh, like severe. Sorry, severe community acquired pneumonia patients who remain hypertensive despite fluid resuscitation, it was, you've always got to consider that they might have adrenal insufficiency. So they, it's possible that they could um, uh, respond to glucocorticoid treatment. So that's always something that you've got to think of. And uh, I think you were mentioning before, uh, Ben, about uh, chest x-ray? or Yeah, something about some, chest x-ray. Something about chest x-ray. Well, chest radiography is often necessary. Like, um, I think uh, signs and symptoms-wise... It's, it's, it's a hit and miss sometimes. So chest radiography is something that um, uh, people fall on to try and um, differentiate between community-acquired pneumonia and uh, other conditions uh, like TB and things like that. So in your chest x-ray, you might find certain risk factors um, for increased severity like cavitation or multilobar involvement that will point you into the direction of uh, how you should go about managing this patient's um, pneumonia. Um, sometimes you get uh, a finding that um, gives some other etiologic uh, diagnosis. So, for example, upper lobe cavitating lesions um, would suggest uh, tuberculosis and things like that. Um, it's rarely necessary to do a CT, so don't order one for your pneumonia patient. Um, but uh, definitely chest radiography is... Um, something to think about and uh, after four weeks always try and repeat your chest radiograph because the underneath all the the rubbish that you might see on the chest x-ray they could have um, a neoplasm or something that is actually causing the pneumonia the chronic pneumonia and um, it's always just a good rule of thumb you had something to say amanda yeah, exactly so as, as as part of your initial workup and in a patient for with pneumonia mm-hmm. as as you mentioned harry you do the chest uh, chest x-ray you do uh, full blood count, you're looking for yeah. elevated neutrophil count, uh, which indicates an, an infection, um, you know, basic metabolic profile, uh, which includes like um, baseline bloods, uh, like renal function, hematocrit and glucose. Uh, you, you plug the patient to an oximetry um, to check for um, hypoxia, uh, respiratory acidosis. You, you, so you do then an ABG as well. Uh, blood cultures, sputum cultures to look for an, uh, uh, an etiology, uh, sputum gram stain as well. Other tests also to consider, as you mentioned, you do uh, CT chest, uh, bronchoscopy, uh, serology, uh, pleurocentesis in cases of uh, an exudate or a, an MPE on, on a chest x-ray. Um, and that's basically like the, the most common uh, diagnostic tests that we usually do to our patients all right so um once we've done the test and we've uh, kind of diagnosed um diagnosed pneumonia we've treated it um what, what kind of prognosis can we expect for the patients now the prognosis is generally good for patients treated with the appropriate antibiotics uh, only roughly 80% of patients treated with antibiotics have a resolution of clinical signs and symptoms. Mm-hmm. The median time to clinical improvement is around two to three days. And there, there's a meta-analysis of 127 uh, study cohorts revealed a mortality nearly of nearly 14%. So the range is from about 5% for hospitalized and ambulatory patients to over 30% for patients and intensive uh, care. Factors associated with increased risk of mortality include male sex, pluritic It's 11 pain. o'clock. Thank you. Thank um, you, Radio hi- much. Hypothermia, systolic hypotension, te- tachypnea, um, diabetes, neoplastic disease, neurological disease, bacteremia, leukopenia, um, leuco- and um, multilobar radiographical pulmonary infiltrate. So these are bad things to have. 
um, in addition to pneumonia, they can increase your risk of mortality. Um, in terms of complications of pneumonia, um, we have a, a long list of um, things that might go wrong. Um, ARDS, acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome, is um, a short term uh, with a medium likelihood uh, complication. Uh, so um, ARDS is a condition of uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and severe lung inflammation. And this complication is associated with uh, a 30 to 50 percent mortality and is treated with uh, low tidal volume, um, pressure, limited mechanical ventilation. So it's quite a, a serious life-threatening complication of pneumonia. We have uh, empyema. Uh, patients with pneumonia might have uh, metastatic infections such as uh, empyema, which usually are treated with uh, antibiotics and uh, um, operative drainage. We have meningitis as a complication of pneumonia. Patients with pneumonia might have um, might develop meningitis, which again can be treated with antibiotics. Uh, and specifically, we choose antibiotics that have the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier, because we know from our um, anatomy, histology, and biology studies at Monash University, which is a great university. Um, beautiful, that's beautiful. How, does it, how does it compare to John Hopkins? Just as a little side uh, Exactly. Uh, think, well, uh, of course, you know, there's no comparison between them, yeah, I think uh, Monash, Monash is, and John Hopkins. Monash is clearly, from what I've seen, the better university. Uh, it's it possibly exactly. be, one of the best universities in the world. That's exactly. quite a claim coming from a professor of John Hopkins. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's definitely. Uh, from what I've seen, um, the, uh, the teaching at... Uh, uh, the, the Monash medical system is is beautiful. It, exactly. it brings it to it's my well eye. Ahead, uh, well ahead of the curve. Yeah. Yes, definitely. But the medical exactly. students from um, the Monash the Monash system are far well beyond their years. Um, all of them consultant level. That's absolutely exactly. incredible. Mm. That's incredible. Yeah, we have a lot of cadavers here at Monash. Mm. It's, it's good, you know, to study anatomy. It's good a place to study anatomy. Correct. Good. Yeah. We have CBP as well. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, CBP is, uh, is, is an amazing part of um, yeah. the Monash yeah. system. So for the listeners out there who don't really know what CBP is, it's community-based practice. We get put in um, schools to do something. Do some do a bit of research and get an idea of how the community is, uh, responds to medical uh, the medical world. I guess understanding how how um, the, the, the real people, you know, the, the people that we treat in the future, you know, um, how they view the medical system is, is an important way of, um, you know, getting to know them and understanding how we should manage uh, exactly. certain illnesses. You know? Exactly. I, I have a mnemonic which involves CBP. Um, okay, and, uh, go for it. And exactly, yeah. So if you, if you have obstructive jaundice, uh, which... <laughs> this is not going to be like the amantadine, is it? I mean, uh, that one was hilarious but um, we, didn't, no, no, we, didn't get, we didn't, didn't get it out we couldn't even get it we out we didn't even get it out it was too funny it was too funny yeah. exactly no, if you have obstruction of the biliary um, system and um, which which can cause obstructive um, jaundice mm. um, I, I have C, CBP uh, and, and the way to remember that is that if you have an obstructive cause of, of jaundice then you have um, conjugated bilirubin yeah in, in your urine so you have C conjugated B bilirubin mm-hmm. and P to P to P out which is urine so you have conjugated bilirubin in, in the P or in, in the urine so from, so, obstru- um, from obstructive jaundice exactly so yeah. if you have obstruction yeah. to the biliary system then think CBP not community uh, community community based ac- practice <laughs> <We've> <laughs> community too much <laughs> mania for you exactly yeah. yeah no it's like um, conjugated bilirubin P definitely yeah, yeah. yeah. cool cool see you know uh this is the life of a medical student. Now, Correct. life for us is just a collection of mnemonics and mm. acronyms. Yeah, I have an acronym to remember my my family members. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's, that's difficult in itself. I know. I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, cool. Going back to to the complications of um of pneumonia, we mentioned yeah. meningitis. We have infective endocarditis as um as a, 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 a complication with a low likelihood, actually. Is that um, because, uh, wouldn't that be one of the causes, like gingivitis, uh, co- oh, well, it would be a comorbidity, I guess, because gingivitis um, is uh, one of the higher risk, causes a higher risk of um, pneumonia because mm-hmm. of the as- uh, the whole aspiration aspect. Um, so is, is that is that more of a complication or 
you know, coexisting um, uh, comorbidity, I should say. Well, the, the research papers that I have in front of me here from the Lancet um, says that um, uh, actually infective endocarditis is, is, is a complication. But as you mentioned, um, I, I mean, I can't dispute your, your argument here. You said um, it could be a, a coexistent problem. So it could be, yeah, definitely. Mm. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, my apologies, Professor. That's a, oh, no, because I've just written a lot of um, articles in The Lancet and, uh, you know, I think 90% of articles are mine. Yeah, so, I was yeah. going to say, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe Harry wrote those articles. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I'd know the topic better, so... Exactly. So, you know, Indeed. Exactly. Back, back down there, man. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, so, so we have pericarditis, uh, peritonitis, um, arthritis, pleural effusion, and lung abscess, all as complications of... Um, of pneumonia. Mm. What about what about septic shock? What do you think? Yeah, Mary, you yeah septic you? shock, respiratory failure, multi organ failure. These are these are things that are caused by the the fact that it is an infection. It is a bacterial problem, and it can become a systemic uh, problem that can uh, run wreak havoc across the whole body. And um, you know, I think something that we as uh, you know future practitioners have to talk about, I think, is prevention. So as um, I think we were talking about at the start, um, some of the uh, big uh, ways to prevent uh, pneumonia are through vaccination. And I think um, at the start of uh, uh, the show, before, before we went to air, um, influenza and pneumococcal vaccines were definitely something that we were talking about. And I think all of us here have got our flu vax for the year. I know I have. In the, in the hospital, they get it for free. Exactly. So they, I, had, I had the three because they were free. <laughs> I'm still trying to fundraise the sixteen dollars at the moment. Oh my so. gosh, sixteen dollars! Yeah, I think I think they're giving it at some pharmacies for fourteen. Though, if you hunt around a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, definitely get on that. You know, there's no fun having, you know, pneumonia, the flu, and all that kind of rubbish. That's right. Definitely. Yep. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break for a few minutes, and um, we'll be back in a moment. And uh, now we're going to move on to talking a little bit more about general kind of indications for respiratory um, problems. So, Amanda, I might give it to you here. Okay, so um, what was your question, sorry? I, I, was, <laughs> I, I was thinking of the amantadine story again. I don't, I don't believe there was one, but maybe we could just go quickly over the um, clinical pulmonary infection score calculator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, basically, um, because uh, there's a kind of a lack of a specificity in the clinical diagnosis of um community-acquired pneumonia, they uh, basically took all the signs and symptoms and all that jazz and sort of weighed it up and said, this is how, this should be worth this many points, this should be worth this many points. And they created this um, CPIS, the Clinical Pulmonary Infection Score. So um, using this, basically, we're trying to differentiate between who should get the therapy and who should, who should not. So who's not a serious enough case that we should risk antibi- uh, antibacterial resistance and who really needs a therapy and uh, that we should probably start therapy as soon as we can. Um, and this should be done sort of after your, you've considered all the alternate diagnoses and all the, um, uh, all the other things that have gone on with the, the patient. So basically, um, we look at things, so in broad spectrum, we look at uh, fever, leukocyto- leukocytosis, um, the oxygenation, uh, the chest radiograph and the tracheal aspirate. So those, um, those one, two, three, four, five, f- five headings. There are certain points allocated to different findings within those headings. So if you've got a fever that's um, greater than thirty-eight point five, but less than thirty-eight point nine, so not thirty-nine yet, you can give them one score. But if you've got something that's above thirty-nine, below thirty-six, then you give them two points. So um, I guess. Uh, uh, one way to one easy way to just sort of remember this like an as an offhand you know a quick checklist is to say is the fever severe or not so we know that normal temperature being 37 37.5 around that kind of area if the fever is high give them more of a suspicion and uh, give more weight to the fact that you think that they have got a, quite a severe um, problem so then you go to leukocytosis, so looking at the FBE, so looking at leukocytes, so less than 4,000 or greater than 11,000 microliters, definitely have to give them a point there. Um, and it's something that uh, will come later on uh, as you look at the, um, uh, as you finally get the bloods back from the, the labs. Um, then next, oxygenation, which is um, can be done uh, at a bedside 
uh, in a bedside way. So looking at um, the respiratory rate and um, millimeters mercury, looking at the PaO2 and things like that can give you an idea of how severe it is. The chest radiograph, if it's localized, if it's um, quite patchy or diffuse, and if the progression of the infiltrate, so no acute respiratory distress, distress, distress syndrome or chronic heart failure, congestive heart failure, I should say, um, causing the pleural edema and all that, um, all that jazz. So looking at the chest radiograph, you can allocate a lot of points there. And the last point, uh, tracheal aspirate. So if they've had quite a lot of growth on the, on the plate and uh, there is some morphology on the gram stain, then uh, as, you sa as we said before, remember the atypical pneumonias, the gram stain is, does not come back. But on the typical, it does. So you can give a maximum score of 12, but it's not important, um, I guess, at this stage as a student to remember the whole scoring system and where every point is allocated. But just remember that the main diagnostic factors that determine severity, the fever, leukocytosis, oxygenation, the chest radiograph, and tracheal aspirate. And uh, if uh, do you have anything to add, Amanda? No, I don't think so. That was yeah. really thorough. Yeah, so... Yeah, and uh, just remember those things and uh, you'll be on your way to uh, diagnosing and uh, managing exactly. pneumonia. And, uh, yeah. Clinical no success, time. really. Yeah. On your way to clinical success. Exactly. Yeah. You can impress your um, consultants now. Okay, so um, do you want to move on to um, uh, maybe just looking at some steps of the respiratory examination? Um, yeah, you yeah, want to take yeah, this no, okay, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So basically with, with any examination, you approach the patient, you um, introduce yourself, you define who you are, what you're going to do, and what's your position. You say... Um, we starting like, with the history or the exam? The, um, the, is it, was it the exam? We'll do the examination. Yeah. The examina yeah, yeah, go examination, for it, go for it, yeah. Yeah, so um, you introduce yourself. Uh, you say, okay, I'm a student doctor. I'm a medical student, and I'm here to examine your chest. Is that all right? You can give them more information about what you're going to do, but that's up to you, and it depends on your time constraints. If you're like a, um, in, in the OSCE, you don't have enough time, so just make it um, really quick and um, to the point. And then um, after that, you... Um, do two important things, uh, and I have a mnemonic for that. Um, uh, Just for two things, you have a mnemonic for two things. Exactly, yeah. So um, he loves his it's like <laughs> it's like uh, P and A. It's like P E, and P E does not stand for pulmonary embolism in this case. It stands for position and exposure. Mm -hmm. So you position the bed and the patient. Um, and uh, we know that in a respiratory examination, you need to put the bed in to a uh, forty-five degrees. Yep. Um, and to expose the patient, you need to expose the chest um, or uh, the chest region of the patient as well. So you ask them to remove their top or gown. And um, in females, actually, like the uh, to do it properly, you need to ask the uh, female patient to um, take take out or take off her bra but but in 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 the exam or in a clinical setting in the hospital it's actually difficult to do that so we ask um to uh keep the bra on a female patient actually and cover um the um, breast region with with the sheet until we reach the uh, chest ins inspection and okay after you do the pe the position and exposure um you might also like to expose the legs of the patient. Sometimes you can do this just to check for a peripheral edema, or you can do this at the end. It's up to you. Or any signs of kind of like DVT or anything like that. You're looking exactly. I'm at the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Exactly, definitely. And then you stand at the end of the bed, and you have a general look at the surrounding of the bed, at the room. Yep. You you're looking for any. Um, oxygen machines, any CPAP machines, any uh, sputum mugs, any bronchodilators, asthma devices, exactly, yeah. any yeah. medications, exactly, any walking aids, for example, anything that might give you a clue to what's wrong with the patient, and then you move on from looking at the room into looking at the patient himself. So you look at the patient, you have a good look at the patient, you check their general appearance, you um, check their nutritional status. If they're uh, cachectic or cyanotic, exactly. yeah, that's yep. important, definitely. So you look at the color of the patient as well, whether they are cyanotic, whether they are um, um, uh, you know, diaphoretic. Um, you look at the uh, usage of accessory um, respiratory muscles, as Ham Harry explained uh, uh, previously. Uh, so that's part of the general inspection. And you might want to also look quickly at um, observe for stridor, um, yeah. which would indicate a medical emergency at this exactly. stage. And so then you'd, yes. you'd go into 
Um, yeah, so obstruction is yeah definitely something. Yep. So you, you listen to to, yeah. to any sounds associated yeah. with their breathing. You yeah, ask them to yeah. cough twice, perhaps to definitely. Yep. Yeah. To to just uh, give you more information about that. On the note of stride or wheeze, also is well, one of the something a sound that you can uh, audible sound that you can hear. You know, exactly. Which is uh, it's a good mention there. On the yeah, absolutely. There's a good uh, YouTube video <coughs> about wheezing and uh, stuff. Great. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, All so, right. So yeah, once I, we've done the general um, appearance, what yeah. what we kind of need to look just for some general symptoms. So, right, so um, heart rate, respiratory rate. Yeah. So um, like um, a lot a lot of people like to start with the hands before they go into vitals, okay, so that they enough. just remember. But um, you can also definitely start with the vitals or pull out the chart, um, and uh, have a look at O2 sats, respiratory rate, blood pressure, things like that. Um, being hypoxic and things like that is is not not good in a respiratory patient but um, always a good thing to look at the vitals so in the hands you're looking um you, you probably start with the nails things like that um, you're looking for signs of clubbing to, to tobacco staining uh if they're cyanotic in any way or anything like that um and uh, you can go up and down the fingers and have a looking for things um and uh, i think the next important thing is probably outstretch the hands look for asterixis and uh, uh and then um, get them to cock the wrists. So looking for CO2 narcosis. So asterix is being the fine tremor for um, salbutamol use and things like that. Um, well, it could be due to CO2 retention. Yes, yeah, yeah. CO2, yeah, CO2 Which, retention um, in the, the flapping, the flapping tremor, when yeah, you cough, flapping cough, back the, yeah, yeah. cough back the wrists and things like that. It's, it's not specific, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's a yeah. significant, yeah, uh, significant finding right. to have. Yeah. And uh, I think Italian O'Connor goes into wrist tenderness, HPO, hypertrophic pulmonary, pulmonary osteoarthropathy and um a lot of people like to do wrist tenderness um but uh from experience uh the regs don't seem to like us doing um wasting our time looking for wrist tenderness but you know for in the sake of oskies i think it's yeah. probably a good idea to look for exactly and finger abduction as well apical lung tumor you know that compressing would compress on, t1 yeah something yeah correct that would that might also present with uh wasting or, Correct, yeah. yeah. Wasting of the muscles and things like that is always something to look out for. But once we've done that, now we yep. should get back to um, the uh, charts and the um, yep. uh, kind of vital signs. Uh, yep. Obviously, you do normal vital signs, but there might be a few things you might look for, like uh, pulsus paradoxus, yeah, which would indicate definitely. quite significant COPD or very severe asthma, which is basically where you have a um, an abnormally large decrease in the systolic blood pressure during inspiration. Um or a bounding pulse, which is like a where you have a really, really, really strong leaping and forceful pulse that quickly disappears. Um, Correct. Yeah. That would indicate potentially asthma, very strong, uh, severe case of asthma. But once we've moved on from there, we want to look at yeah. the face and upper airways. Do you want to give us any suggestions what we might look for there, Amanda? Yeah, definitely. So, um, in the face, you, you well first you um, uh, check for. Uh, yeah, oh. so signs of Horner's syndrome exactly, yeah, and yeah. things Horner's like syndrome. that. So ptosis, myosis, and hydrosis. Mm -hmm. So and uh, those, that's something that uh, so the sympathetic chain have to look out for that conjunctival pallor. Always ask the patient before you touch mm -hmm. them. You know, make sure that they you know poke them in the eye. Central cyanosis. Get them to open their mouth. Look under the tongue. Um, that's a big key sign for central cyanosis. Also, look in the in the nose for any. Um, swellings or anything like that and gorge polyps, yep. Yep. polyps correct um, polyps yeah yep. always a good idea symptoms. yeah and then um i think uh, probably the next step would be to move down to the neck mm -hmm. yes. if, you, if you have time you can yeah. also you can always uh, palpate the face for any pain on, yeah. on the so um, sinuses or sinuses yeah, it might be worth yeah. looking at the lymph nodes as well in the area yep. yep definitely so lymphadenopathy and things like that um palpate from the back and the front supraclavicular ascending descending chains things like that good yeah, idea absolutely. yeah okay. um, feeling for the trachea in the sternal notch always a good idea so um tracheal tug as well is also a good idea um what would you go on to next would you start with the front or go to the back just do a general appearance of the chest first yeah, of all i, I start with the anterior chest and then anterior move on to the back. yeah okay although the back gives you more information like in terms of the any basal crack holes and stuff correct um it, it depends. It depends on, on, you know, how old the patient is and the circumstances within which the examination is conducted. But usually, um, uh, you know, the book, the way, the, the way the book, uh, telling the coroner, 
uh, does it, you start anteriorly with the anterior chest, you look for any deformities, um, any scars, um, um, any, as, as we mentioned, any uh, usage of accessory muscles. Um, and then after that, you, uh, you move on to percussion. So you, or is there anything else that you look for as well? I think there's a bit in palpation. Um, for example, often it's, there's, there's a test that you can do where you put the, uh, your fingers and just in the supraclavicular area and you just get the patient to inhale or inspire. And mm -hmm. if you can feel the scalenus muscle kind of contracting there, you might indicate that there's some sort of, uh, accessory, minor accessory muscle use that might indicate minor pathology that's starting. Oh, are well, we on the anterior chest, are we? Oh, sorry, I just zoned yeah. out for a second there. Did we, we mentioned like apex bead and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so yeah, you want to, you want to find the apex yeah, bead. Right. You also want to, um, check chest expansion. Yep. And um, good, if, good. if you haven't got good chest expansion at the back, you might want to do um, Hoover's yeah. sign, which is essentially where we're check, checking yeah. the uh, chest in expansion at the front. Yeah. Um, and at this stage, you also might want to feel the ribs and just look for any tenderness um, mm -hmm. that might indicate some sort of... Um, Rip fracture, for yeah, example. Yeah, and you want to, you want to palpate um, anteri anterior to posterior and then along laterally. Yeah. Just uh, on a personal note, do you like to do tactile, fremitus or vocal resonance? I do tactile. You do tactile? Yep. Yeah. I don't know. I like to do vocal instead. Oh, is this yeah. the American way of doing it? No. I don't is, know. Is oh, yeah, yeah. The vo American way. Because, I mean, uh, when you're doing, you know, 99 and things like that, you can uh, you can hear the sounds really well. And uh, you can. there's a lot of diagnosis in uh, doing vocal resonance. Mm -hmm. But I guess the Monash way is tactile, exactly. tactile premise. Yeah. We, we do great. one, one, one. Ah, yeah. Beautiful. That's why students fail the OSCE because they spend too much time saying one, one, one. One, one, one. Yeah. So you, you gotta you gotta get on top of your patient, make sure that they're you know like literally. In the oh. <laughs> no, that'd be inappropriate, and uh, uh, you definitely not, fail not the best not best practice. Not best practice. Yeah. So exactly. I don't I don't see that in up to date or any PubMed or anything like that. Exactly. So, okay. So we so need to we need to percuss. What what do we have to do there? Yes. Yeah, so what do you want to do in percussion, Mander? Well, percussion, you you use a systematic approach and you compare both sides. So you do like one percussion on the right, you do the opposite on the left. You don't, you know, do right side and you finish the right side and then you move on to the left side because you need to compare both sides and you listen to the sounds as well. So you start with the super, um, the apex of the apices of the lungs uh, and the supraclavicular fossa, and then you do the clavicles. And you percuss those directly, don't you? You don't Di need exactly. You don't need yep. it, um, directly the clavicles, and then you move. Um, you know, inferiorly, and then you percuss laterally as well. It's important to also perhaps go towards the axilla, and um, posteriorly you percuss that when you uh, start on the posterior wall. But mm -hmm. before you do that, you ask the patient to cross their arms or touch their shoulders, their hands, so you can move the scapulae laterally, which gives you more exposure yep. to the um, lung fields. Um, I saw a lot of students like you know they do the respiratory examination without asking the patient to do that. This might um, interfere with the finding of um, some uh, uh, lung pathologies. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely, definitely. Um, and just just some tips for the students who have a lot of trouble with percussion because it is a skill that you need to master. The trick is to put your uh, the finger that you're percussing onto as firmly down as you can, and then to tap tap kind of the mid middle part of that finger really quickly and let let your finger come off it so that there's there's a kind of a resonation of sound. Um, and it just takes a little bit of practice, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the same with the PR examination. Yeah. yeah I mean, not uh, the same directions. Yeah. Um, but but uh, it's it's yeah. it takes time. You need to practice on as <laughs> many patients as you can. That's that's correct. Okay, yeah. great, man. You just yeah. just contribution today is fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Exactly. Just, okay, uh, so we need yeah. to move on to auscultation before we end up doing. Exactly. Well, auscultation. You you again auscultate the longer APCs. Um, you auscultate uh, the anterior chest, you move on to laterally, and then uh, posteriorly, again, you ask the patient to cross their arms, touch their shoulders, so um, you, you expose the lungs as, um, and you can listen to, to the um, sounds, respiratory sounds. And then uh, you, there are different types of respiratory sounds that you hear, the normal ones and the abnormal ones, and there's a, a clear... Um, thorough um, description of that in Tally in the Corner and we recommend that we it's, refer you to the, to the yeah, book too yes. Yeah, the breath sounds are, you know, and also the, yeah, the description also, yeah. of uh, vocal resonance which I don't think we have time to go into but yeah. just the things you should listen to um, well, well mentioned in Tally in the Corner 
Um, just a quick note on auscultation, though. Mm -hmm. You might want to listen to the supraclavicular area with the bell and then the rest of the lungs with mm -hmm. the diaphragm of the stethoscope, and that might give you the best kind of... Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Auscultation yeah. technique. Yeah. Um, and just, just last notes. There, there are obviously a few other things that you might want to look for. Um, so at the end of the examination, you might want to quickly do Pemberton sign, mm -hmm. which is where you get the patient to put their arms up... Um, and a positive yeah. sign would be uh, the yeah. degeneration of facial plethora, cyanosis, kind of inspiratory strata, um, uh, non pulsive. Just, okay. venous yeah, just basically. It's just, just yeah. venous congestion of the face. And exactly. that would indicate yeah. superior vena cava yeah. instruction, uh, yeah. obstruction. I you might want to look for yeah. edema. Also, look at the EJB if you get a quick chance. You know, JVP, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, JVP is always yeah. good to look at. Exactly. Just get a get a feel of all those kinds of things. And to complete yeah. your examination, you um, you, you yeah you, you look at, at the chart if you mm. um, the ops chart you if you it. haven't looked at it be pre previously. You also uh, would like to perform some basic bedside um, tests such as a peak flow meter or to um, to perform uh, or to examine the cardiovascular system as well or spirometry as you mentioned. Yeah. So that's about it for today, I guess. Um, we we rushed through to the end there, but I think we got there. So exactly. Um, yeah. Thanks for listening and thanks, uh, Professor Harry, for coming in from John Hopkins. No worries, anytime. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, guys.